someone claiming Yahweh was a dragon. And I was like, okay, okay, no, no, this is ridiculous. And like, he started showing pictures of Chinese dragons to support his case. And I'm like, were you high when you did this? Like, none of this makes sense. So I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Mike from Inspiring Philosophy. And we got to discuss the 10 most common questions I think every Christian gets asked at some point in their life. For me, I kind of get asked these questions daily, but it comes with the, uh, with the ministry that I'm doing. So we're going over things like why believe God in the first place, why the Christian God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the last question is probably one of the most important ones. But before we get into the video, if you like what I'm doing, if you support my content, you support my ministry, please drop a comment, please subscribe, please hit that bell icon. It really helps out and I greatly appreciate it. And if you really wanna support my ministry, you could support me on Patreon. This takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of resources. So every penny helps and everything goes back into the ministry. And without further ado, let's get on to the video. I only got introduced to you pretty much when you came to TikTok. So through like really? brought through blood, you know, uh, yeah, Pastor John, he's, mm -hmm. he did the video with you and he's like, hey, this is inspiring philosophy. He just came to TikTok. And I, I checked you out and I was like, okay, this guy seems like he knows what he's talking about. And then I went and like binged a whole bunch of your videos and I'm like, okay, he really <laughs> knows what he's talking about. So can you tell me a little bit about your story and kind of like how you got started doing what you're doing? Yeah. So I graduated college uh, with my undergraduate years ago, back when the earth was young. Uh, so back in like 2011, 2012. And so the only job I could get at the time was working a nighttime security job. So I was like, all right, well, I got nothing to do for eight hours in the middle of the night. So I started watching YouTube. Uh, there was a lot of really bad stuff on there. And I'm like, you know what? I, I know how to do video editing. I could start doing videos and post them. So I did that. And shortly after I got a job, moved, did other things, and the channel just kept sort of going. So I just kept going with the channel and eventually it turned into a full-time job in 2019. So that's why I got started on YouTube. And then, of course, I branched out on TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, other platforms as well. Yeah, we, we needed you here on TikTok, man. A lot of... I, uh... I have noticed there is a lot of crazy... <laughs> oh, man. What's, uh, what's some of the craziest things you've seen on here? Well, I just did a video recently of someone claiming Yahweh was a dragon. And I was like, okay, okay, no, no, this is ridiculous. And like... He started showing pictures of Chinese dragons to support his case. And I'm like, were you high when you did this? Like, none of this makes sense. Of course, there's the flat earth nonsense, which is always the craziest. Uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, everything in Christianity goes to paganism. It's all Constantine's fault. That nonsense. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on here that's just utterly absurd. Yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been pretty hectic, pretty crazy. And I don't think we've had too many people like on our side who are actually defending the faith. It just seems to be all like ex evangelicals who like because, you know, like most Christians don't actually read their Bible. So like they 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 go to church on Sundays and listen. But the few that like do that leave the faith, usually the ones who leave the faith, they've actually read it. So they like have an arsenal. To like come at Christians and be like, hey, this is why your faith sucks and they can't really defend it, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Because I wanted to go through like these common questions that people are throwing at us all the time and that Christians get baffled because, well, they haven't spent that time in studying it. In all fairness, it's a big book. It's hard to study. So with that being said, you want to get started? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, bro. So the first question I got for you is the, the most common one. Why, do we should, why should we believe in God at all? Like, why should we believe God exists? Okay, so – Think about a common argument used against theism. It's that science is sort of eroding God. And, you know, we don't need God anymore to explain things we use in the past. God is sort of eroding. Reverse that. Flip it on them. No, what actually has happened is science has been eroding away natural gods. Ideas of Zeus, Thor. What happened? Why did I have a cat? Why did that really <laughs> pop up? So it's people donating to you. That's what that okay. is. Okay, fine. Keep donating. Fine. You can do more. I didn't know that. I just saw random hats with a pop on my head, and I was like, what is going on here? But um, anyway, so it's been eroding away natural gods. The idea of Zeus, Thor, these gods that live in the universe and control things like lightning and that kind of thing. Science has not been eroding away a transcendent deity, someone who created the universe, who's outside of space-time. In fact, the more science has been going, the more evidence we've been getting for a creator. And I mean that. Go back 200 years. Uh, I was just reading Nicholas Rupke 
recently in the book Science and Religion. He says that geology, the study of geology was eroding away enlightenment deism and atheistic views that the earth was eternal. So they believe the earth was eternal, didn't need a creator. Christians at the time, according to Rupke, uh, were using geology to show the universe or the earth did have a beginning point and eroded away a lot of ideas that the earth was always eternal, went back to Aristotle. Then, of course, well, they said, well, the universe is eternal, doesn't need a creator. This was Einstein's view at first. George Lemaitre's Alexander Friedman, two Christians come on the scene. They propose the primeval atom theory, which you know as the Big Bang Theory. That showed the universe had a beginning, and many atheists up front, like Fred Hoyle, were mocking it, saying this is ridiculous, it's anti-scientific, all of this. That, so that in itself, science revealed the universe, the classical space-time does have a beginning point. And that also supports contingency arguments for God's existence. The idea of the universe is contingent and needs a creator. And on top of that, we discovered fine-tuning. The parameters that hold the universe are on a razor's edge, like the cosmological constant that's slowly expanding the universe. If that was off by 1 in 10 to the 120th power, the universe would either collapse back in on itself or expand too fast for anything like atoms to form. And there's multiple uh, fine-tuning constants like that, like the strong and weak nuclear force, other things around the nature of the curvature, space-time, all of these. So that has also strengthened the case for theism. Now we not only need a creator, we need a very intelligent creator to find you in the universe. Then quantum field theory, uh, which more we discover that, the more deep down we go, the less likely that there is an idea that the universe is material at its base. It's more likely information. That would support the idea that it, it, it's contingent upon a mind. And I go through this in a lot more detail in my YouTube channel. But when people say that you know, science is sort of eroding God, no, the more we have studied the universe, the more we have studied things uh, like morality and consciousness, the more we realize that there is not a natural explanation for these things. And a theistic explanation or a personal explanation is far more likely. So when it comes to contingency arguments, cosmolo you know, like beginning of the universe, fine tuning, uh, the idea that the, the uh, quantum field theory has showed us there was no material at the base. It, it's more likely just information down there, uh, as well as consciousness. There's no evidence. The more we study brain, the less likely we're, it is that the brain creates consciousness. Um, and yeah, I can defend that as well if, we, if you want to go into that. Same with ethics. There's no evidence ethics reduces to some sort of natural substance. Uh, it's more likely that that would also imply a personal uh, creator as well. So the more we study reality, and specifically science, the more we are getting evidence that there is – we can make the philosophical inference there is a creator of some sort. So why believe in God? Well, the evidence keeps pointing us in that direction, and there was less evidence 100 years ago. Now there's even more evidence. So basically what you're saying is as we keep studying, we're finding that the beginning point, things had to be created, the fine-tuning. Uh, I wanted to touch on the fine-tuning. Why is it not possible that we just randomly hit – that fine-tuning aspect where we just have a universe that could support life well, instead of something possible. had to create it. Yeah, well, it's possible, but it's just improbable. I mean, the odds of that happening is just astronomically low. It's far more likely that there was a creator who intended to create this universe based on just probability. What would be more probable? I mean, here's an analogy that um, happened once. I, yeah, I'm getting these a lot, apparently. So think of- um, I'm a fan, man. Think, you're at, a, you're at a card. You're at a card game. Uh, the dealer has keeps getting. You're, you're playing a game of poker, and the dealer keeps laying down four aces every time. It's been five, six, seven hands, four aces every time. Uh, eighth hand, you get up, you're ready to pummel the guy because he's taking all your money. And he goes, "Hold on a second, guys. Let's say there's an infinite number of universes, and we just happen to be in the right universe where I keep getting aces every hand. Sure, it's possible, and you can't prove I'm cheating. Okay, you're gonna believe him." Or are you going to believe that he's probably cheating? Yeah, it, it's about a probability there. It's far more probable he's cheating than that he you just happen to be in the lucky universe. So you're just looking at what's the more likely option. So based with the fine tuning, it's more likely that somebody actually tuned it. Um, another thing I wanted to ask is, and, and I don't want to go too crazy into it, uh, the brain consciousness. Like determinists will say that we don't have consciousness right. at all. It's just things firing and firing and firing. So how would you argue against that? I mean, if we don't have consciousness and there are limited materialists, that would be the term for that. I'm going to ask, who am I talking to? Who are these conscious beings saying we don't have conscious uh, consciousness? Uh, it, it's an absurd position. And there is no, this, is, this is something called the hard problem. It's called the hard problem because it's very hard to explain how subjectivity 
uh, consciousness could arise from just chemical firings in your brain. There is nothing about our subjective experiences that points to this idea of just chemicals moving around inside the brain. There is, this is why it's called the heart problem. How do you get consciousness from chemicals inside the brain, from electrical signals inside the brain? There is no evidence. The only thing neuroscience has shown is that there's correlations. And substance dualists, idealists like myself will agree, of course there are going to be correlations. We predict correlations in the brain when it comes to consciousness. That's the whole point. Uh, but you have to show that somehow the brain creates consciousness. And the more we study consciousness, the more we study the brain, the bigger that gap is getting. There does not seem to be a good explanation of the hard problem. How are you going to get subjective experience from objective or material substances working inside the brain? And if people want more, there's a great philosopher, Bernardo Castrop, who's written extensively on this. You can also check out my Irreducible Mind series on YouTube. It's five parts. I go through a lot of evidence, deal with objections. But there's just this is why it's called the hard problem. It's a hard problem for a reason. And there's just, you know, as, um, what is it? Ned Block said, we have nothing, not a zilch worthy of a research program. Researchers are stumped. How are you going to get this? So you don't think, you don't think cause and effect is the answer? Cause and effect. What do you mean? So like, basically, uh, I tried ice cream before I tried vanilla ice cream. I liked it. So next time I have a choice in ice cream, my brain knows that I liked it. So there's a cause, there's effect. And it's just a series of things happening in order, making us do these things. And we actually don't have a consciousness or we don't have a choice. Like this is the argument I will hear from uh, naturalists. So they're, they're assuming that they're, they're presupposing the conclusion they want. That it's just the brain causing us to think that way. Uh, it's actually, there is nothing in the electrical signals from the tongue to the brain that is the taste of ice cream. That is something different. Taste is different from an electrical signal. I could stimulate your brain to make you feel like you're getting that signal. But you know that that signal, the electrical signal, there's nothing qualitatively similar to the actual experience of taste. All we have is a correlation. And you can have the, the taste of ice cream without the correlation necessarily uh, because you, know, you could stimulate from the brain or you could do this. I mean – there's a, there's a big gap in here between subjective qualities and electrical signals. So think of it like this. Uh, you, you see in front of you, uh, you know, this gray shirt. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is actually, according, according to physicalists, what is actually happening is that there are uh, wavelengths hitting your eyes, causing a chemical signal in your eye that is going to the brain, causing the experience of gray. Nothing in that transfer of information is the experience of gray. All we see in the brain is these electrical signals going back and forth. You cannot see gray inside the brain. That's the whole point of the hard problem. What you're actually oh, okay. seeing is a transfer of information. Think of it like this. If unless – this is an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. But it's an analogy. If – when you look at your computer screen, okay, you'll see an icon in the dashboard, and Donald Hoffman has used this analogy. Okay. What's actually happening is the computer code. There's different these codes, things going on. Ones and zeros are popping up around. If all you saw was the ones and zeros, could you make out the computer icon? Well, not unless you were super smart and understood computer knowledge. Okay, The ones and zeros only correlates with the, the appearance of the icon on the computer screen. But we wouldn't say it, it's exactly identical. There, there's, there's one is causing the other. You could argue that. But what Hoffman is arguing is like analogously, what we see is sort of like a dashboard. We see the computer screen. Uh, we and underlying there's all these signals going on these ones and zeros and all this bouncing uh, in the ones and zeros you don't have colors you don't have uh, shapes uh, that's sort of the brain interpreting the way these signals are sort of coming in same with the external world uh, we are seeing all of these in, incoming data and the, when we study the science of it we don't see the color gray we don't see the color red we see wavelengths we see chemical signals how does wavelengths and chemical signals get you colors? There's, there's, a, there's, so, a, there's an epistemic gap there. So because we're experiencing it, uh, that would imply that there's a consciousness, right? So if we weren't experiencing it, all we would be doing is taking in the information, the data, the ones and zeros, and reacting accordingly. But because I can see, you know, I can see the orange on this can, I can experience that. That implies a consciousness. Is this what you're saying? Well, why, why would the brain need to create 
consciousness if you know you could it, it, you know it, it's one of those things that's like survival doesn't really necessarily need that you could have just a computer a biological computer running around surviving why create this complicated system called consciousness when the inputs and the outputs understanding the brain understanding all it's not necessary to invoke conscious experiences but we all know we're conscious i think therefore i am you cannot deny you're conscious in fact we start with consciousness this is the argument from the idealist we are consciousness that's our beginning point we should begin with the understanding that we are conscious and then the material world we can we, is sort of built upon that so again this is a very complicated subject i understand that but the basic point is when you understand the brain there is nothing in there that would predict consciousness and there's an analogy used in philosophy called p zombies it stands for philosophical zombie you could encounter somebody who lacks consciousness but has is able to display every human quality that you have everything how would you be able to distinguish a conscious person from a p zombie well you mm. wouldn't be able to and that's the point you don't need to need consciousness why not just have us all as p zombies if consciousness is unnecessary I understand. Uh, yeah, I, and we could probably spend all night just on this subject alone. So, <laughs> with that being said, we have this we have this concept now. So everything kind of points that there's a creator out there. Something created all of us. Why do you believe it's the Christian God rather than the Hindu God or the Muslim God or Zeus or, or any of these other four thousand gods that people will claim are out there? And we're just what's the saying is that we're all atheists to all these other gods except one. They just believe in one less God. You've heard that one? Yeah, I hate, I hate that argument because it's so stupid because you're just conflating. It's an equivocation fallacy. You're, you're basically assuming worldviews. I mean I, I have my one worldview. You have your worldview. I, I reject all these 4,000 other worldviews out there. What's stopping me from holding to your worldview? That's basically all they're saying. It, it doesn't make any sense uh, because they're, they're, they're taking one aspect of a worldview and not actually comparing worldviews. They're just taking the deistic or the theistic aspect of it. Of the world even saying, look, my worldview lacks that. Good, good for you. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, why the Christian God, though? Okay, well, the first thing is if we understand from cla from classical apologetics, from classical theism, uh, natural theology, that the moral argument, the idea that this the, the creator by the universe is absolutely moral, we would expect him to be all loving. We would expect him to want to reveal himself to his cre uh, creations in some way. Uh, so some religion, I would say, is likely true based on that. Which God is the most loving? I would argue quite easily it is the Christian God. Jesus comes, lives as a poor carpenter, lives not as a king, not as a ruler, but as this traveling preacher who is persecuted, deals with all sorts of uh, people that he frustrates him, and then dies the death of a criminal for our sins. That in itself is a good signpost to which is going to be the most loving gods. The God of Islam does not really care to get off his throne and come down and save us. Uh, we're expected to sort of get our way through, through there through good works. Uh, the God of Christianity cares so much that he empties himself and becomes and lives the life of a pauper and basically a criminal. Or doesn't live as a criminal but dies as a criminal. So that's a good signpost. Of course, the best evidence, again, is the resurrection argument. Uh, this is why I'm a Christian. There is sufficient evidence that the resurrection of Christ did actually occur based on evidence that we got. Uh, Jesus, it's pretty clear that Jesus was crucified. There is not a historian out there, unless you're a Jesus mysticist, that denies that. And even Jesus mysticists Je say Jesus was crucified just on the firmament or somewhere in the heavens. That's how much of an established historical fact it is. Sorry, Muslims. Jesus was crucified. So that, that right in there makes me just doubt Islam entirely. The fact that they deny Jesus' crucifixion, it blows my mind how bad of a position that is to hold. So Well, they, they believe crucified. somebody else took, took the place, right, so that we would believe that he was crucified. Does that hold no weight Great. to you? Great. Your God's a deceiver and is intentionally creating the world's largest religion to deceive billions of people. Swell guy. Really a loving God there. Uh, you know. And why are there no like first century sources that even say, it, it boggles the mind again? Um, <laughs> obvious, obvious error. Like, so Jesus was crucified. There's good evidence Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I, I, I went through a whole video on this uh, about a year ago where I just covered all the evidence Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. Uh, okay, then we have an empty tomb because you have all these other things lining up. So the disciples 
scattered, terrified. Early report, uh, all the reports agree the tomb was found empty on Sunday morning. Okay, so now we got to deal with that. Uh, Jesus was buried, and all of a sudden the tomb's missing. His disciples were convinced he rose from the dead. Understand that in its cultural context is strange. If you want to compare it, think of Simon Bar Giora. This was the guy that was the alleged Messiah that rebelled against Rome in around 70 AD. He was taken back to Rome and executed. Failed Messiah. Imagine if his – no hint of this happened, but none of his followers ever from this event said, I feel like Simon was resurrected, and he's now at the, the right hand of the Father, and I've, I've seen him, and he's, he's, his physical body has been raised. That idea was completely unheard of in Jewish Messianic movements. You did not have a dying and rising Messiah. You had a conquering Messiah. This is why all the Messianic movements were about a Messiah who was going to be conquering, defeating Rome. But for some reason, the Christians just decided that the Messiah died and then rose, and that proved he was the Messiah. Okay, there, there's nothing in Judaism that would have predicted that to happen. So it's a very odd thing for the disciples to claim, and that they experience this physical resurrected body. Then you also have skeptics converting, like Paul and James, the brother of Jesus. What would it take? I don't know if you have any siblings, but I don't know what it would take for you to, to think your sibling was the Messiah and God himself. It take a lot for me. Uh, so there is a weird, uh, again, conversion there. So you have skeptics converting. You have this idea that was so foreign to the cultural background that even Paul is admitting in Corinthians that it's like it's a stumbling block to it, it, to the Gentiles and to the Jews. It's mockery. This is it, this is something that was so foreign to them, and it was you know ridiculous. We have new depictions of Christians being mocked for worshiping a crucified God very early on. Wasn't so yeah the idea of God being put on the cross in the first place was just you would never even bring that up. That's not even something they would contemplate, right? No, you would never. And even the Gentile world would would have been found that found, it found it ridiculous. Celsus mocks the Christians for believing in this. We have this early depiction, one of the earliest depictions of a Christian worshiping <clears throat> Jesus on the cross, has it with a picture of, of Jesus with the head of a donkey, because it's like Alaximos worships as God, is what it says. And they're basically saying this guy is such an idiot for worshiping a crucified God. Something so foreign, it, it was ridiculous. So it'd be really weird for them to make this up. Then you also have early evidence that people like Paul and Peter died for the faith. James in the book of Acts, uh, one of the James, one of the disciples, that is, uh, died for this. Paul talks about being persecuted for this. So they're not getting money from this. They're not getting a great cult they can you know control because Paul's moving from town to town and has to write letters to correct their stupidity. Not a really good group of people you can easily control based on that. Uh, when you start piling up these these little these little indicators here, here, and here, and here, you start to build a pretty cumulative case that the most likely explanation for what happened is a resurrection, a physical resurrection. And when you compare it, the best thing to do is what Mike Lacona does in his book on the resurrection, compares it to natural hypotheses. When you start comparing the resurrection to natural hypotheses, the resurrection is the most parsimonious. It's the least ad hoc. Uh, it's the most plausible. Atheists will say, but it's a miracle. Okay, but yeah, if you assume a naturalistic world, you're always going to presuppose a miracle is the least probable. Let's throw that aside. Let's be agnostic. Let's not start with naturalism, theism. Let's just be agnostic. What's going to be the least ad hoc, the most plausible? The resurrection is always going to have the least amount of assumptions. Don't talk to me about quality of assumptions because quality – if you're going to judge the quality of an assumption, you're going to do it from a worldview. You're going to be like, oh, well, a miracle is – if you're a natural, so mm -hmm. miracles going to be least probable because I already know naturalism is true. Put it aside. What is going to have the least – the quantity? So I'm not quality, quantity of assumptions. The resurrection is going to win every time. And Michael Conan does this quite well in his book on the resurrection. So if I was trying to sum it up really short, so you believe that – if God's real, then obviously he has to be a loving God. If he's a loving God, then he interacts with us. If he interacts with us, then one of the religions has to be true. It points originally to Christianity because Christianity shows the most loving God with Jesus Christ sacrificing himself, being humiliated, crucified, and the resurrection having a strong historical account points it to being real. And this is this is why we believe Christianity is the true religion. Yes, absolutely. And then we can add additional awesome. data on top of that, the reliability of the New Testament. <laughs> The reliability of the Old Testament, currently on my YouTube channel, I'm going through the evidence for the Exodus to the conquest. A lot of good evidence that confirms that the, the account is quite accurate when it occurred. 
That's a that's a great segue because the next question I have is can we can we trust the Bible at all? Like why is it a trustworthy source? Like if the stories are true, obviously we can go, okay, this is a good account for God. But how do we know it's just not a lie in the first place? Because we have a lot of good evidence for the reliability of these documents. Uh, so take for example, um, Colin Hem Hem was it Colin Hammer, I believe it is. Yeah. Went through the book of Acts. The last couple chapters, I think, like the, from Acts 10 to the conclusion, it sounds there's 84 facts that Luke gets right. 84. He, he gets the right – he gets the, um, the right accurate description of like borders, slang terminology in towns. He knows that like in this town, it's called a clerk, a town clerk. In the other town, it's called like a magistrate. He's able to differentiate all of this. It's very clear he was a traveling companion to Paul because you're not going to get these type of details without that. Craig Blomberg does this with the Gospel of John. 59 confirmed facts in the Gospel of John uh, in his book, The His Historical Reliability of John's Gospel. They get all these little details right that it'd be absurd for some later forger to make this up. You also have evidence of the fact that when they're recounting Jesus' teachings, they're doing it in a way uh, that a rabbi would speak to his disciples. They're, they're, the way Jesus talks is in the form of a parallelismus membarum. It's a long term there, but basically it's a rhythmic style that rabbis use from the day to sort of say da 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 And so they are able to – so that sort of supports the idea that what we're seeing is a reliable oral tradition handed down to us because it's still preserving elements of oral tradition in there. Uh, the idea that Jesus uses a lot of stories, again, very common for oral traditions because stories are easier to remember. Uh, a lot of the uh, things that they talk about uh, – recently I talked about – uh, this idea of Pharisees in Galilee in a recent video on my YouTube channel. And before 70 AD, there were more Shamite Pharisees than Halalite Pharisees. Well, when Jesus is talking about washing a cup, you know, mocking the Pharisee, he uses the Shamite understanding of ritual regarding washing cups. After 70 AD, the Shamite, um, the Shamite practices died out in Galilee. So it must date to a tradition prior to 70 AD where the Shamites had more dominance, and Jesus would have been responding to Shamite Pharisee practices. Someone writing after 70 AD is going to get that wrong, because they're going to be using the Halalite uh, Pharisaic custom. Little things like that. There's a ton of little facts like that. Uh, our understanding of Pontius Pilate aligns quite well with how he's portrayed in Josephus and uh, Philo. Uh, it, it very much fits with the culture of the time, very much fits with understanding of a lot of markers throughout Galilee and Judea. When you start going through all these details, there's a lot of facts that come in that say what we're getting is a reliable historical account that's been handed down to us. So by looking at all the small details, uh, so like basically locations, how they behaved, uh, the way people spoke, all things kind of like line up with the culture. And that's a good reason to believe that they actually lived in this culture, that they were actually experiencing, that they're actually doing these things. Is that correct? Correct. And again, if Craig Blomberg, Craig, Craig Blomberg only had like three or four facts in the John he could confirm, cool. That's not a good point. But he's got 59. 59 confirmed facts that we know from the culture. John's gospel aligns quite well with that. That's that's pretty good. I mean, again, it's it's about a cumulative case. If you had one or two or three, not a lot. But when you have 59, together that makes quite a strong case that you know what we're seeing here is a, a reliable historical count. And again, Colin Hammer. Yeah, 84 facts confirmed in the last 16 chapters of the book of Acts. Uh, you could go through the book of Matthew, Michael Mark, and find similar things as well. I've been doing them through my supposed Bible contradiction series on YouTube, uh, not only refuting the objections, but showing that actually there's more evidence to confirm the book of Mark here or the book of Matthew here. Hmm. So with that, with that being said, then, we can confirm that they are really there, that they're really doing these things. But how do we know that they weren't um, some sort of conspiracy theorists, that they were trying to – like the common argument you'll hear is that Jesus was just a rabbi, that he's apocalyptic preacher and that he got, you know, hung up for his troubles from doing this. And his apostles just glorified him in this way in these writings. So they, they made it seem like he'd performed these miracles and made it seem like he he was the son of God or made these claims that he made. But the reality is he was just a rabbi. He was just a preacher. So ultimately, can we trust the authors and what they're saying? OK, well, if he was just a rabbi and just a preacher – he would just have wound up as a footnote in Josephus. I mean, Josephus mentions mess other messianic groups, and Rome defeated them, killed the leader. They're gone. Uh, you know what happened? 
the disciples dispersed and got themselves a new Messiah, or they moved on. There was no evidence the Jews would then take this guy and say, actually, this proves he's the Messiah because he was killed. That, that was, again, that was, that was offensive to the Jews of the time. They would have looked at it mm. as horrible. No, the, the Messiah is supposed to rescue us from oppressed, the Gentile oppressors. He's not supposed to die and then resurrect so that he could save us from our sins. You know, their understanding was, well, we don't, we don't need to worry about that. We have the, the, the Torah from Moses. That teaches us how to live. That teaches us how to do, do sacrifice. We don't need an, uh, someone to die for us. It was offensive to them. Uh, so this just seems like a very weird thing for the disciples to do, and then take it to the Gentile world, where you know that would have been. Where we know Gentiles mocked this idea, uh, like, and they are included now in the covenant. Like these these pork eating Gentiles are now being accepted by the Messiah. And Paul goes so, so far as to say, "Your body is the temple of the Most High." That would have been extremely offensive to the uh, Jews of the time. The, God resided in the temple in Jerusalem, and only the high priest could go near it. Gentiles were not even allowed in the temple. You're telling me the Most High resides on them? Totally offensive. It, it's incredibly weird. And even a lot of secular scholars do admit the rise of Christianity is a conundrum. It just it seems very weird for this group to just start saying and doing these things. Why would they just now start believing the Messiah – had to die and rise. And their, their explanation is, well, you know, they were so stressed out from his death, they just had to make up the story. Again, that, that it, it's such a weird thing to do, we know, with the Jewish background. The more likely thing to do is get yourself a new Messiah. And they had a good alternative. James, the brother of the Lord. I, I mean, we know because he was an early leader in the early church. So why not just go with him as the new Messiah? Or why not uh, revert back to um, Peter, for example? Why not say, well, actually, you know, Peter was... You know, Jesus was only preparing the way for this Simon, this Peter fellow, and he's really the most – not what happened. Couldn't, couldn't somebody argue that maybe they were trying to start some sort of rebellion, some sort of change because they didn't like the current state that they're in with like the Pharisees and the Sadducees always being over top, that maybe they were trying to break these chains so they invented this, this new concept, this new religion? Oh, yeah. Well, we know we have a group that did that. It's called the Essenes. And they went to the desert and kept their own writings, and we have a lot of them. Uh, again, just, it's about what they did was they resorted to purity. We need to get away from the world, those evil heathen pagans out there, those evil people in the temple. We're going to restart a whole new thing. We know what Jews did when they decided that the culture was bad. They became – they did things like the Essenes, for example. Uh, and again, to, when they start welcoming Gentiles in, it allowed them to eat pork. Uh, again, totally offensive. We've been totally against their understanding of what we see in Maccabees, their interpretations of the Torah. All of this stuff. Very – again, still very weird for them to do. It, it's possible they just made it all up because they couldn't deal with the fact that Jesus was crucified. OK, but then you know, to then to go out and be persecuted and die for this and not really get any money or you know, followings, to be rejected by your own people for the most part. I mean uh, to then – and then have to deal with all these Gentiles who don't understand the Torah and keep trying to teach them and spend all this money writing these expensive letters because letters were not cheap back then. Again, there's, there, it just doesn't make sense with the cultural context. And again, we also know they proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus in Jerusalem pretty early on. Jesus was buried in a tomb. It had been very easy for the Pharisees or the San, Sanhedrin to debunk this quite easily. We got the body. Uh, Justin Martyr, writing in the second century in his dialogue with Trypho, tells, says that Trypho is still telling you know, everyone that you – know, you're still telling everyone that the, Jew, that the disciples stole the body. Um, so obviously they're kind of admitting the body just couldn't, they, they couldn't just show the body to debunk this. The body went missing. So odd, odd admission there. So basically the idea that is very counterintuitive that they would do this kind of shows that they were being honest. Cause like if they wanted to do something that was malicious to be something that was a little bit more beneficial, but because everything that they were doing is more like getting them persecuted, getting them attacked, you know, being offensive to the culture, being offensive to themselves. This is a reason to believe their honesty, correct? Correct. Yeah, it, it helps the pro – raises the probability. That's the argument we use in, in the study of history. It raises the probability okay. in favor of the resurrection hypothesis. Awesome, man. So now we have a God. We believe it's the Christian God. Why is the Christian God worthy of worship? When I read through the Old Testament, I see him, you know, I see him killing entire groups of people. I see commandments to kill infants, things like this. If he's all good and he's all loving – why is that just and why should I give him my worship? So 
let's let's think about this for example uh, a lot of time in ancient near eastern annals you you'll see things like um uh, idea like uh, the Italian enemy was entirely obliterated. We left none alive. Uh, it's very much this idea that uh, it's hyperbole. It's sort of like today. Uh, you know, I, I watched the hockey game the other night, and the Penguins obliterated the New York Rangers. It was they utterly annihilated them. They won easily. Okay, you don't think that actually happened? You don't think people actually died? It's a hyperbole. So take Tut Moses the Third's. Um, he says this, the numerous armies of Mitanni were overthrown within an hour, annihilated totally, like those non-existence. Hittite king, uh, Mersili II, says uh, the, the mountain was empty of humanity, and the mountains of Tarek Arumu empty of humanity. Israel's, or um, Merneptus Delius says, Israel is laid waste, his seed is ruined. The Meshus Delius says, Israel is utterly perished always. Okay. They did this in the ancient years. They did hyperbole. They talked about the defeating of the enemies in this way. A lot. Uh, there's a great book called "Did God Command Genocide?" And they point out in this book that when uh, they're talking about, like in Samuel, First Samuel 15, like utterly to kill all the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child, leave none alive to breathe. But you read a couple chapters later in First Samuel, David is dealing with the Amalekites. I thought they were annihilated. Well, no, it's hyperbole. It's like just take them all out, kind of a mentality. Okay, so. It's not this idea that we get. We have misunderstood the cultural context. It's not this idea that go kill them all. It's defeat them. It's just the same way we talk about sports games. So, no, I don't think that's actually what's being commanded because we can study the ancient Near Con, ancient Near Eastern context and see something very similar when we're doing these types of things. And is that is that true for all these tribes that are wiped out or were there any stories that where it was like, yeah, you just you just killed everybody? No, no. It, it, again, the Amalekites are showing up again. Like many knights are showing up again. So, like K. Lawrence Stanger, for example, said that many scholars failed to recognize the hype, hyperbolic nature of the account in Joshua. This is where a lot of people go. Like they annihilated all the Canaanites, and this becomes clear once compared to the hyper, hyperbolic nature of other ancient Near Eastern accounts of complete conquest. Um, in Mesopotamia, we have similar war annals, and Karen Rain and Mitnajat says that uh, they often talked about them utterly wiping out all the people, but then they report later that they brought back all these people and made them slaves. Well, wait, I thought you said when you went to battle against this other city-state, you won and annihilated them, but then you brought back all these people? Well, which is, well, ancient Near Eastern um, war hyperbole. It's, and Nicholas Wolterstorff says it's high geographic hyperbole. This is what's happening in the biblical accounts, like First Samuel, Joshua. That's what it's going on here. And that's not specifically to the word like annihilate or take out. Like it could be used in a sense like, I, I don't remember the exact verse off the top of my head, but there's one that's like, um, may they fall on your sword. So it's like, you know, every man, woman, and child, may they fall on their sword. Would this be the same there as well or exact yeah, same thing? Yeah. So, Yeah, it's the same thing. It, it's it's just, it's hyperbole. God is not commanding them for them to go in and kill all the infants of the Amala. Of the, Amala the, um, sorry, the name just escaped me there. The Amalekites? Amalek yeah, the Amalekites. Yeah, so... I, I, again, this has been understood. And Zion Zevit notes this. There's a Nicholas Wolterstorff. Uh, a lot of scholars have noted when you start comparing Joshua, 1 Samuel, to the ancient or eastern accounts like Tutmosis III, Hittites, um, even Assyrian rulers, you see a very similar language. Okay. So what about uh, places like um, obviously the flood and then uh, Sodom and Gomorrah where God directly just destroys all of it? Well, I like that you compared those two. That's good because remember what happens with Sodom and Gomorrah. This is very important. God, Abraham is like, look, if there are just 10 righteous people in the city, will you spare? And God says, absolutely. There ain't. Uh, uh, like there just isn't. This is a horrible, this, this, this horrible city. I mean like – and the best people in the city are Lot and his daughters who you know we know were not the best people ever. That was the – Richard Dawkins, even in a moment of clarity, said if if these were the best people in Sodom, you can't but help feel a little sympathy for what God is trying to do here. And, you know, people complain, like, well, if God really cared, why doesn't he not take out the evil people? Well, he does, and then you get mad at him for it. Like, he's gotta, <laughs> like what do you want here? Like, when, when he doesn't take out the bad people, you think, oh, well, he just doesn't care about it. But when he takes out the bad people, well, why would he? <laughs> like, okay, for, th that, that's the first point there. Okay, and then with the flood, same thing. I argue it's a regional flood. Now, if God can send angels into Sodom to get the good people out, and 
he could do the same thing with a regional flood, like in Noah's day. He could, you know, it was so wicked. There was just none left alive that were good. Uh, so that kind of mentality there. Um, and again, I, like, no, why did, well, why did they, why did he tell Noah to leave? Well, Noah was a prophet. He was, his, the building of his ark was warning to the people, preaching, hey, flood is coming. You need to repent. I'm not going to lie. I'm pumped that you said it was a regional flood because I believe a regional flood and I felt like an outlier because of that. So the fact that you believe that kind of kind of pumps me up a little bit. Uh, so to, well, let me give you to, let me let me give you a good argument go that it's a regional flood. OK, it says that um, in, in the beginning of chapter eight, it says that the, the waters were receding and the tops of the mountains were seen. Then you get down to verses eight and nine, and it says the, d- Noah releases the dove, and it says the dove found no place to set its foot, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Well, wait a minute. I thought the mountains – you could see tops of mountains, but now you're telling me the waters on the face of the whole earth? Well, it's hyperbole. Again, it, it, when the whole earth does not mean whole globe. It just means there's still a lot of water. So if you can use that in – Verse nine, where it clearly cannot mean the whole earth because you can see the tops of mountains. It, you can use that in in chapter seven as well. Yeah, the one I liked was with uh, with Joseph. It said all the world went to him for food, <laughs> and clearly it wasn't the whole world. So, like, I just I just assume that the same nature, the same because it's the same author. So I assumed he's exactly. using the same kind of metaphor hyperbole in this situation. Plus, actual uh, history shows. That there was most likely a flood in this area, if I'm not mistaken on that. Would you agree? I did a I did a video about maybe a year or two ago on new evidence for Noah's flood. And yeah, there was a paper that was published that in uh, uh, Mesopotamia, roughly about maybe the end of the Younger Dryas period, there was this massive flood that formed what he called a mega lake. So it went very far up the Euphrates and the Tigris, filled up parts of Arabia. Um, and the geological evidence supports the study. There was this massive mega lake formed for a period of maybe about a year or so before it drained out. It just it, it, it took so long to drain out because the only way to drain out was this one area. So I'm going to push a little bit more on the on the Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. What about the babies that were there? Would they be so evil? What, so uh, the question, of course, is does God have a right? to do with whatever he wants to like. This is something people don't like to talk about because it's very hard. But yes, God has a right to do with whatever he wants to life. Okay? Uh, he, is, he, he gave life. He can take it away. Metaphysically, we do not have a right to life. We could say it in a political sense we do. But in a metaphysical sense, our, our, God has a right to take away life whenever he sees fit. If he knows the future better than we do, he knows it's better possibly to – take away lives in this instance to prevent something far worse from happening. So if there were babies in those areas, okay, again, could not God have sent angels in to get them out or get the innocent people out? Very likely could, yes. Same kind of concept with Lot. Why couldn't he do that same thing as well with the flood or with uh, these um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Even if there are babies in there, again, you're talking about you're talking about God, again, has the right to take away life and do whatever he wants. And again, if there is an age of accountability, it's not like you know they're annihilated or condemned. It, this is about that uh, God is able to save those who he wants. He will pass judgment on who he wants. That's a hard pill to swallow. I get that. But that's something we all need to accept. If he sees that he needs to send in a disaster to prevent some far worse evil from happening in the future, uh, then we need to trust his judgment on that. And we also need to understand metaphysically he has a right to give and to judge life. Okay, we don't have a right to life. And again, also, it's not like they're, you know, they're, it's not like the idea that they're condemned to hell for this now. That'd be absurd. I think that's an absurd position to hold to. Yeah, the, I think there's a verse in, uh, I think it's Jeremiah, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but basically what it says is, uh, don't weep for the righteous if they're taken because I'm saving them from the evil that they would endure. Um, yeah. Something along those lines. So with that being said, one thing that's quite clear in the Bible, like I don't think we can really dispute that it was was in there, at least written from front to back is slavery and slavery. Slavery is a pretty evil thing. And God himself gave the rules on how to handle slaves. If he did that, how does that make him good? So let's talk about this for a second. Three, verse, three verses I, I can give to help support. Remember Matthew 19. Pharisees come to Jesus and says, you know, like, why did God give us a law of divorce? And he says, he gave you a law of divorce because your hearts were hard. That is a bombshell. People sort of overlook that. He's right there admitting that God did not 
agree with everything in the Torah, but he gave it to them because it was a compromise. First Samuel, again, back to this. First Samuel 8, I believe it is. Israel comes to Samuel and says, we demand a king. God says, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea, guys. He says, no, we want it anyway. Okay, fine. I'll modify my covenant with you. You'll now have a king. No, I don't like it, but I'll do it for you. Yet Numbers, I think it's Numbers 22. The, the daughters of this one guy come and say, hey, our, our, our father didn't have any male children, and we're going to be screwed. We need, we need inheritance. And they go, they take this before God, and they go, yeah, add that into the covenant. I like it. It's a great idea. They, they should have some sort of inheritance here. So it tells us God gave the Torah based on a compromise because their hearts were hard. Uh, uh, he included things they didn't want, like a king, and he allowed an input from Israel. Okay, this was a compromise. This was not the final end-all, be-all that we have in Christ. This was a stepping stone. If you have somebody who is in prison for, let's say, murder, they repent, they come out. Are you going to let them watch a daycare right away? No, you're not going to because you understand that the, there was a process for people coming out of these uh, bad situations and you just can't give them everything right away. The point of Genesis 1 to 11 is there was a degradation happening with humanity. Things kept getting worse and they degraded to such a low point. God is going to come back into this picture with Abraham and then Israel and say, okay, I'm going to start leading humanity back to a much better place, back to how it was in Eden. I obviously just can't get them there because they're not ready for that. Let's get some stepping stones going here. What do you think the Torah is? It's a compromise. It's, it's given because their hearts were hard, but it wasn't the final end-all, be-all. It's to sort of help give some guidance. John Walton, scholar, says it's about understanding in the ancient Near East that it was how to be a light to those nations. What could they do that should represent God best to them? Give them certain things to make them see that Israel is the light. Hopefully start getting humanity back to a better place. Not everything's going to be perfect, but again, we see that the law was fulfilling Christ, and now we have a much more perfect covenant under him, that kind of concept. So yeah, God is going to allow things he does not like in there because he's trying to get humanity but to a better place. He still is. Okay, he's not going to expect us to be absolutely perfect right away. He's going to work with what he's got there. He's working within a culture in the ancient Near East. Let him do that. It, it, I mean, if we were going to do something similar, do you think we could go back in time and go, okay, guys, get rid of slavery. We're going to form a constitution about equal rights, also form a democracy. That's going to be much better. They're not going to understand democracy. It's going to, it, it's going to be hard. God tried that with sort of like a modification of that with the elders of Israel meeting. And they, what do they do? Monarchy right away. That's what we want. We want a monarchy. A couple hundred years in. No, this isn't working out. So God is trying to work within a culture to get them to a better place. We understand we cannot do the same thing. It'd be very – I mean we're trying to spread democracy to the Middle East. It's not going well. It's very hard. We have to make compromises along the way, and I think we messed it up even worse. Okay? God obviously did a much better job than we did in you know, much longer time process. Let God work within the culture. See a video I did called The Imperfect Mosaic Law where I cover this more. So, where was I going to go with that? So, from my understanding, too, is there there was other cultures around that had very similar laws, but the laws were like more deprived. So, one law, for example, is it says in the Torah that if a slave is to run away and he's hiding with you, that you're not to return him to his master. But from my understanding, there's other laws out there that would say that if your slave ran away, that you were to be to return to your master and then beaten or tortured or things like this. Is this true? Yeah, Israel had cities designed that slaves could run away if they were having issues. And, and so they were able to go to these certain cities and, and seek comfort and safety, and Israel would protect them. So, so you have that kind of idea. So could you not argue go that um, God actually gave more rights to the slaves of the time than they currently could ever have with the other cultures surrounding them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This was, I did another video called the Revolutionary Mosaic Law, where I point out yeah, the, the way Israel designed laws, uh, it was far better. It, there, was, there was some laws in Assyrian laws where it's like – I forget the exact terminology, but if a man rapes another a woman, then it, like his wife needs to be raped. Okay, that's horrible. Like, but that was the didactic understanding of those nature and those laws, and that's just completely devoid in Israel, like that kind of mentality there. Like they're not going to suffer the sins of the father mentality there. Like if the father did something, he should be punished. The son is not going to be punished. In Hammurabi, it's like if a builder's uh, if a if a builder 
the house collapses and kills the son, then his son is going to be put to death. Like, so in short, no, yeah. so in short, what what God's trying to do here is He's trying to guide us along the right path. So similar to like a child, you're not going to have a child paying rent when it's born. You're going to first show them how to walk. You're going to show them how to put their toys away. You're going to show them how to behave properly in, in their household. And eventually, you get to the point where they're a full functioning adult. This is God doing the same thing with Israel. It's like okay. First of all, treat your slaves like people. Next step, we're going to try to actually get rid of them and treat them as complete equals. Would you say that's correct? Absolutely. That is part of the stepping stone here. Uh, you definitely see a much better – and even scholars will admit this. The Mosaic Law is far better than a lot of the other engineers' or laws, especially the, especially the middle Assyrian laws. Like, whew, don't read those. Um, and let, don't, read those on a, don't read those on a full stomach is what I'll say. Uh, I mean it's I, – I, they're pretty bad. Uh, so I mean – also, so that that's definitely something you got to think about in this. Also, you got to think about the Mosaic Law. It's not a law. It's not a law code. This is important. People think what's going to Israel is like judicial laws. Like, oh, someone you know, you know, committed adultery. Let's open the Torah. Let's see what to do. Remember David's affair with Bathsheba? He should have been put to death mm -hmm. for that. He's not. Yes. Put to death. Why not? Because that's what the Torah said, and they even reference the Torah in that when Nathan comes to them, they reference passages in the Torah. Okay, because it was understood as didactic. It's more about teaching judicial wisdom. It's not laying down absolute uh, moral law or moral laws that had to be followed and were always binding. It's not like modern laws. Um, it's more about teaching judicial wisdom. This is how you're supposed to think about justice. This is how you're supposed to think about holiness in the ancient Near East. So they were not always binding. They were not always saying like this is always the penalty that can be carried out, kind of thing. Like that's very divorced from what the actual purpose of it was. It was more about teaching them how to think. Think of Proverbs. Proverbs is not teaching you what to do. It's teaching you how to think. Uh, you're not going to literally do everything in Proverbs. It's like, you know, so like the, the famous passage is answer a fool and he will um, be stuck in his ways, but ignore a fool, he'll be stuck in his ways. Okay, he's not telling you how to deal with fools. He's telling you how to think. Likewise, the Torah is doing something... Ancient Near Eastern law codes, or more like legal treatises like Hammurabi, were not laws. They were more about displaying the king's wisdom, his judicial wisdom in that sense. So they were not actually giving laws to Israel. They were teaching Israel how to think about holiness, how to think about justice, think about how to think and act in this culture. And scholars like Gilbert Hillers, John Walton will tell you that there was a lot of leeway for courts to make decisions here on how to deal with these laws. Uh, how to deal with answers. And the, the Deuteronomy talks about this. Like, you know, let the courts decide these kinds of things. Well, if you're letting the courts decide, why why would you be giving the laws? Well, because they're not laws. They're judicial wisdom. That's how you understand the, the Mosaic Law. It's not a law. It's a teaching. It's an instruction on how to think. So that actually, that's a great segue too. So why then, that would answer a lot of the primary laws of like, like, um, how to treat your neighbor and things like this. But when it comes to like food laws and not wearing mixed fabrics and things like that, things that seem very direct and specific, why don't Christians, most Christians currently follow this now or should they follow this now? Be because we don't have to, the, the law was fulfilled in Christ. It doesn't mean it's ended. It means he has upheld it perfectly for us. Romans three is like by our faith in Christ, we uphold the law. So we don't have to do the law. He did it for us. We uphold the law through our faith in him. It's our faith in Christ is what we do. So Christ upholds the law. He did it perfectly. And now he is new, the mediator between us and God. What does he turn around and say? Keep the Torah? No, he says, love one another. All right, today I give thee a new commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself, or love you as I have loved you. Paul, for all the law of some have been one thing, you should love thy neighbor as thyself. So in our new covenant with Christ, he has uphold the law perfectly for us. He now turns around as our new priest and says, okay, now I just want you guys to focus on loving one another. Uh, for symbols, a baptism, Eucharist good on that uh never once does he say make sure you're keeping the sabbath everyone that's very it, it i don't understand the torah keeping movement I, I feel like it's it's fine if you want to do that don't say that's a requirement for christianity that's absurd so why have the food laws in the first place if it's just going to be something that god was ultimately going to take away like what is the wisdom we got from that so in in, in richard hess's book israelite religions he deals with this it's about keeping order, displaying order to the surrounding culture of the, of the ancient Near East. So you don't eat ostrich. Why don't you eat ostrich in the Torah? There is no ostriches around there? <laughs> well, there was. They knew of ostriches. It mentioned Was ostrich. there? Oh. Yeah. 
I mean, they knew about from Africa. You know, you don't eat ostrich because it's a bird that doesn't fly. Okay. You don't eat you don't eat lobster because it has legs and it lives in the ocean. You don't eat things that look like they're, they, they 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 symbolize chaos or disorder. A bird is supposed to fly. An ostrich doesn't fly. If it's in the ocean, it's supposed to have fins. It doesn't have fins if it's a lobster. It has legs, like it's supposed to be on land. Displaying order. We're going to show the world that we are Yahweh's order. Food laws help two things. Display order and keep a people distinct so they don't blend with other cultures so the Messiah can come, can come through them. If you have a people that are not going to eat pork and shellfish and all these certain weird dietary restrictions, you're going to stay a pretty distinct people so the Messiah can come through you. Um, if you're if you're not, it's going to be very easy to blend with the other people surrounding you. And, you know that we see that when they when Israel, like the Northern Kingdom, abandoned the Torah, you know they, they blended quite easily. Uh, so there, there's that issue there. So it's like it's Sorry. personal it's personal discipline, right? So it's like equivalent to uh, I get up every day and I make my bed to make sure that it's a start of keeping my life in order, right? So that that's a it, personal thing I do. I make the bed. It reminds me to keep my life just a little bit in order. That to me is almost like a law. Would that be very similar to what's happening here? That, that's a close analogy. Yeah. It's sort of like that idea. I want you to keep order. I want you to keep certain rituals so you show the world you're dedicated to me. It's like, why do we do baptism? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, baptism doesn't necessarily save you. You can be saved without being baptized. I mean, obviously if a thief on the mm-hmm. cross, for example. Uh, but it shows that we are in covenant with Christ. In the ancient Near East, we know from uh, ritual texts there, of the priests, of certain cults had a lot of rituals they did to show that they were dedicated to this one deity. Very complex at times. Israel likewise had very complex rituals to show they were devoted to Yahweh. Food laws, uh, certain uh, rituals concerning like um, certain feasts and certain uh, festivals they had to keep. Certain things they had to do to really show they were in covenant. Very complex in the ancient areas, even prior to the creation of Israel. Same thing, and Israel just sort of picks up that same tradition. There's all these certain things we do to show we are distinct people, we're dedicated to Yahweh, and we're going to say it, stay a distinct people. Okay. I like it, man. That that makes a lot of sense. So uh, moving on to the next question I got for you. Considering the fact that, well, imagine how much studying you've done to have the knowledge that you have, and uh, most Christians don't do this in-depth studying nonetheless, let, let alone just reading the Bible. Then the secular world, they just have this baseline concept of Jesus being like this, this, this fun guy. So how is it just that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, considering that there's a lot of, a lot of ignorance that surrounds him, that most of the world doesn't truly know the nature of who he is? So Christ sort of admits that ignorance does not mean condemnation. So in John 9, 41, John 15, 22... If I had not come, they would have no excuse. But now that I have come, they have no excuse. Uh, uh, Romans 5.13, uh, uh, where there is no law, sin is not counted. So this idea that ignorance does not mean condemnation. So that's an important point there. That is also does not mean you – that also does not mean free ticket to heaven. I think every soul has to choose, even in this life or the next, if they want to go to Christ or not. Um, if somebody – uh, has not been given the proper information. I think there is a process, although we don't know how it works in the afterlife, where they get to make that same kind of choice. Again, we don't know, but I, I would think based on scripture, there is some sort of process that takes over at that point, based on the verses like eight. Okay, so ignorance does not mean condemnation. So the reason why Christ is the only way to heaven is because any other path will lead to condemnation. And this is just philosophically sound. So uh, you know, I re- watched a video recently on TikTok from a, um, some Muslim who was talking about what happens when they die. Like, you'll be in the grave, and then, like, you know, the demons or the tormentors are going to come before you. And on the side, the prayer that you gave in life is going to protect you. And on the side, the charity you did is going to protect you from here. And then your good works and your love will protect I'm like, it terrified me. Because so I'm like, if that's true of Islam, your good works are going to save you, I'm screwed. Um, and. Not only that, but you have just turned yourself into a god. You've turned yourself into an idol. You now worship your good works. That's what's going to save you. Not Allah. Mm. Not, not a savior. Your good works. It's all about you doing the right things. Tim Keller put it like this one day. Uh, let's just say you're a very religious person, Muslim, Mormon, whatever. You can't help but feel superior to non-religious people. They're not doing the right religious things. You just can't help but feel more superior to them. Let's say you're a secularist. 
you, – you can't help but feel superior to religious fundamentalists because you know you have the right path. You're the one who's more focused on equality and loving. And you just can't help. And let's just say you're a hardworking, decent person. You can't help but feel superior to lazy people. But the gospel says you're a moral failure. The gospel says everything you do will not amount to much, and nothing will you do will ever save you. You know, I remember in, in college there was this girl I knew who was a communist and an atheist, and she was volunteering at charities every weekend. I wasn't. I still don't. I'm not good at that. Okay, she's a much better person than I am, but here's the truth. The truth is I'm a sinner and I'm saved by grace. So it doesn't matter how good I am. What matters how good is how he was and how he, good he is. Now, if that is at the center of your life, that's going to equip you to be a change in the world because you can't feel superior. The very nature of the gospel is that you are not superior. You are always going to be the least. You know, The, the church should accept that the people in the church are the least and the worst morally people in the world because we are. That's what the gospel says we are. We are depraved. That is what is going to equip you to go out and bring change to the world. And it's also humbling. You accept your good works can never save you. I am so thankful that when I die, I don't have to rely on my good works to get me to heaven like Muslims expect. Because that would be horrifying. I know it would fail immediately because I understand my own nature. I can just simply count on Christ. Now, take that back to the final point. The reason why Christ is the only way is because it's the only faith out there that says – I will die for you. I, God, who created all, will take the punishment upon me so that I, so that you can live forever with me. You don't have to worry about good works. They're not going to save you. Go out and do good works, yes, but do it because you love me and because I died for you. Don't worry about, though, them saving you. And if you do worry about them saving you, you're going to turn yourself into an idol. Your good works will become your savior. Don't do that. Rely on me. And who could save you? You, your good works through some religious path, or the creator of the universe who has lived the perfect life that I should have lived and died the, per died the death I should have died. That is what will save you. Man, that was, uh, that, that was some wisdom in it. That was deep, dude. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit. So what you're saying is because people will then say, like Muslims will say, okay, you got a free <clears> – <throat> You got a free ticket to do whatever you want. You can just go sin as much as you want. And one thing you pointed out was the humility. And to me, what that says is that if you live in that state of being humble, knowing that you're lesser, that gives you a good ground to go out and actually make a difference in the world. Why would you go out and make the difference in the world if you just have a free reign to sin? Why not just go sin as much as you want? Because you have been changed by the Holy Spirit. Look, if somebody came to my – if I went home one day and they said, hey, a bill came and I paid it for you. And I said, oh, thanks. If it was like $25, great. But what if it was $10,000? I would get down on my knees and thank him for that. Like I'm not going to treat that person the same way I ever did before. Like I'm not going like, – they paid a bill for me that was $10,000. I'm going to make sure I can show my appreciation for the rest of my life in any way I possibly can because they saved me from going to jail or something like that. Now imagine if someone died for your sin, something far infinitely more, more powerful. You're not going to live your life the same way if you fully understand that. You're going to go out and want to please them, show how much grateful you are. A Seneca, for example, says like, you know, like I, I give gifts uh, to those that are grateful, not because they can ever repay me, just so they will you know, love me or show their gratitude in the long run. Uh, this idea that if you give a gift, you're, the proper response is you're going to be grateful. You're going to want to do the good. And this is what the book of James is about. We're going to go out and do good works because we know what Christ did for us. Why would we not want to live differently now? Why would we not want to live as if we truly have been washed and cleaned and want to go out and tell other people about this and live a good life? If we were still living for ourselves, we were not saved. Because we're still living, uh, if we have that free reign to go out and sin, we, we truly were not saved. And our actions show that, you know, uh, we will show, we, Christ says, you will know them by their, their, by their good fruits. So good works do not save us. They're the reaction to salvation. And they're, of course, they're going to be expected. Again, if somebody paid a bill that was $100,000 for you, are you ever going to treat them the same? Are you ever just going to like, are you going to trash their house? Are you going to like – if they say like, hey, I paid that bill for you, can you go out and watch my house? You're going to be like, absolutely. I will do anything to show my appreciation for what you did for me. 
And that's what Christians do. If you want more, there's a video on my YouTube channel called Ancient Relationships, Cultural Context of the Biblical World. I go into this in a lot more detail. I like it, man. I like it. So the last one, and I think this is the, the one most people uh, really struggle with, is God made us. God has foreknowledge of everything that's going to happen. He knows those that are going to be saved. He knows that those are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Is it just that he's created people that are simply designed to ultimately end up in that lake of the fire at the end of the day? And, and if he did make this and he made this state of world and suffering and the lake of fire, does that not inherently just make him an evil God? Well, first of all, I don't know if I'm an eternal conscious torment guy. I think I'm more of an annihilationist guy. So I think they're eventually be annihilated. I, so I don't <laughs> take that view that they're here. Uh, and again, God did not make them for hell. He made free creatures to decide what they want and what they do. Ultimately, everyone gets what they want in the end. So C.S. Lewis puts it like this. When it comes to the doctrine of hell, it is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out sins and give them a fresh start? Well, he did on Calvary. To forgive them? They don't ask to be forgiven. To leave them alone? That's what hell is. There's only two types of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. They choose the path they want to go on. They, they, God gives them that free choice. He did not create them for hell. He created free creatures and gave them a path forward that they're allowed to walk off on. What more could you ask for? If he's going to create us to be determined to go a certain way, we're not humans. We're biological robots. You can't have both. Amen, dude. So I take it you're not a, you're not a Calvinist then? No, I'm not. No. I'm a Molinist. <laughs> How, how much how much time are you got you are you looking to rush off or you got a few more minutes i got plenty of time so th this one's one I, this wasn't on my list of questions but i want to ask this now uh this is one that's recently been brought up to me and i've done no study on calvinism at all but i have a few friends that hold to it true and i've had seen some convincing arguments towards it me personally if calvinism is true um i i don't I will lose a lot of respect I have for God in a sense. Mm -hmm. So with you not being a Calvinist, what is your best argument if you were to sum it up quickly that it is, is not true? So, I mean, that's a difficult question. I would say it's a good question. It's a difficult question. Uh, why do I don't think Calvinism is true? I think it's because scripture does not necessarily teach that. I think Luis de Molina pretty much, dealt with the Calvinist objections and responded in the form of Molinism, uh, how to answer these types of things. God clearly gives people a choice. It's in Deuteronomy, it's in Joshua. It's very clear there's this choice that he gives us in a sense. So that would be my first argument. Of course, there's going to be debate there. Um, I thought William Lane Craig in his debate with James White on Unbelievable did very well showing this kind of mentality there. Uh, so why would I, I would say in a philosophical sense, what would be the point uh, for why would God create creatures simply to condemn them? It seems to count, go against the idea of a loving God. It seems far more likely a loving God in a philosophical sense would create free creatures and give them all an opportunity or all a choice to take the path of good in this life or the next. I do not think uh, that, it, that, that he's going to create uh, rational free creatures like us that would not – have an opportunity and would just simply be condemned because he said so. I mean, that'd be my biggest problem with Calvinism right, Calvinism right there. I just think it's logically inconsistent with what a loving God would want to do. I agree. I think that makes the most sense. Um, I have to like look into scripture personally because that, that that's one I want to know the answer to eventually, but we won't go too deep into it now. So last thing I wanted to ask you that was on my list and, and this one. So for me, like I was an atheist, I became Christian. I've only been a Christian for a year. And the biggest thing for me when I came to Christianity was all the misconceptions I had about what Christianity was. Like, uh, for example, like fire and brimstone for hell, um, like purity culture in that sense. I don't really believe that purity culture has been handled well. There's, there's a lot of things that I dislike on the representation of Christianity. So I've, I've voiced my that on my I've voiced my opinion on that quite a bit. I'm curious if there's something that you can change on how Christianity is being represented. What would you change? I would say our understanding of ethics in the New Testament 
um, as well as the Old Testament, even for that. I don't. I think a lot of times we interpret the ethics of the New Testament as deontic. What that is is it's the idea that there are these certain universal laws we have to follow that are laid down. I say the New Testament teaches something called virtue ethics. The idea that there are virtues we sort of supposed to exemplify, and how we do that will dip, depend differ depending on the situation. So, like, is it always wrong to lie? No, it's not always wrong to lie. There are some times where you need to lie if you're protecting innocent life, like uh, like Rahab with the the, uh, the Israelite spies. She lied to protect them. I would say she did something virtuous there. Likewise, if someone came into my house and was like. Tell us where your family is so we can kill them. I'd be like, oh, yeah, they went out back. Like, you go get them. Like, I'm not going to – like, I'm not – I'm going to lead them astray on purpose, guys, because that's a good thing to do in this situation. I'm not going to tell them the truth there. Uh, the idea about virtue ethics is very much taught in the New Testament where there are certain virtues you have to exemplify, like love, patience, joy, peace, kindness. Paul talks about – I believe in the Colossians, like whatever is good, whatever is trustworthy, whatever is holy – do these things and meditate on these types of things, that kind of idea. Ethics in the New Testament is very much this idea that you're not going to know all the answers until you're in the circumstances that you're in. So you need to figure out what the virtuous action is when you're there. Don't expect to have all the answers right now. Like, oh, regardless of what happens, just lie. If you were living in Nazi Germany and the Nazis came knocking on your door and saying, hey, do you have Jews here? And you did. You're not going to be like, well, I always tell the truth. So, yes, I do. Like, no, that would be horrible. You would be aiding in you know, the, the atrocities there. Lie to them. So I wanted people to understand the ethics of the New Testament teaches virtue ethics. It does not teach deontology or consequentialism. Understand that when you read the ethics of the New Testament, it's not laying down universal laws. So, for example, divorce. People think like only can divorce with what the New Testament allows. So if there's adultery or if a spouse is an unbeliever and wants to leave, that's not what the New Testament is saying. Um, you can divorce if there's spousal abuse, I would say. Just because it doesn't say that doesn't mean we get that from the principles of the New Testament. You know, Jesus says divorce is wrong. But, I mean, if someone committed adultery, it's okay. Paul says adds another exception as well. The idea is like, Divorce is not ideal, but obviously living in the practical implications of the world, we need to understand there's going to be times when divorce is going to be okay. Like getting away a poor wife is being beaten. Divorce. Yes, absolutely. It's okay. It's a virtuous thing to do. Don't try to read the New Testament as if you're a sheep. Like, oh, okay, this is all I can do, whatever it says. Read the New mm -hmm. Testament as if it's giving you wisdom, principles to understand, things to sort of build upon. Now, that does not mean we're always going to get it right. We're going to get it wrong lots of times. Rainer Robinson. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of times we're going to get things wrong. That just is the way it's going to be. But it's giving us principles. It's giving us virtues to understand. Understand what it means to, to exemplify the virtue of love. That's going to be complicated. It's going to take a whole life to figure it out, maybe even more. That's what the New Testament is trying to do, teaching us how to live, how to think, how to reason, not teaching us to be sheep. So start understanding ethics in a whole new way. Understand that you're getting, you've got practical wisdom to employ, and you need to use your reason to think beyond what the New Testament says, building across these principles and not doing anything that contradicts it, obviously, but building upon that to help you reason in your life. It's like that, uh, that old cheesy saying, what would Jesus do, right? So like if you're in a situation, you don't know how to handle it, you go, well, what would Jesus do in this exact same situation? That might not be word for word in the Bible, but you can know the nature of Jesus. He would be loving, he'd be kind, he'd be understanding, he'd be forgiving. So you should apply that same thing in that scenario. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And the, the New Testament calls us to imitate Christ. It very much calls us to imitate him. Uh, you know, it, it, and that's very much in the idea of Aristotelian virtue ethics. It's the idea you cannot do ethics from the armchair. You have to go out and learn from a virtuous teacher and imitate them. You have to imitate the Fromenos, as Aristotle would say. Do what they do. So, you know, for if someone like a deontologist like Immanuel Kant, you can do ethics from the armchair. You can think about all the universal rules and go out and do it. For Aristotle and for Paul and Jesus, no. You have to go out and live, follow after a virtuous teacher, imitate them, do what they do learn how to think and learn to act. And then when you go out, you're still not going to have all the answers. You're not going to have all the answers until you're in certain circumstances. It's very much that uh, give a man a fish and teach a man to fish type of thing, right? So it's not, yeah. it's not just a list of rules on the wall. Follow these rules and you'll be fine. It's like, here's how you handle life. Now go figure out the rest.
Yeah, and that's very much what the New Testament is doing. Remember, Paul says things like, not all is lawful. And he's quoting the Corinthians there. He says, you, as I said, not all is lawful, but not all is helpful. Not all builds up. Think about things that are going to build you up and are going to be helpful. Do those things. Awesome, man. I agree with that. I agree with that tenfold. I think uh, I think that's something I would change as well. All right, boss. That's all I got for you. Is there anything you want to plug? Anything you want to say? No, I'm just working on my uh, video for the conquest right now. That's coming out soon. Uh, this month, I have a video on does Christianity cause Nazism or nationalism, which I'll be releasing soon, showing that no, uh, actually does the opposite. Uh, but yeah, my video. I'm currently editing my video for the conquest, and there's a lot of good evidence the conquest took place. I enjoyed your Exodus video. I still got to watch the second one, but the the first one was yeah. very insightful. Keep doing what Thank you're doing, you. man. Like I think, I think, I think you're a big asset to um, to Christians. Just having Thank a better you. understanding of their belief, and I, I think it's super important in your ministry and the things that you're doing. So keep doing it, man. Well, yeah, same, same to you. Appreciate that.